Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all attendees to this webinar, Designing and Improving Drug Delivery Systems for Self-Administration and Home Use, organized as part of the Innovation Insight Series from Cambridge Design Partnership. This is a selection of white papers and webinars, which is now also supplemented with web panels to become a regular feature amongst our broadcasts. Today, it is entirely based on a panel discussion between a number of my esteemed colleagues. And we open the webinar also for the questions from the audience. I'll be able to watch at my second screen with your questions coming in and um, will either aim to answer them at the end of the panel discussion, or if they're extremely intriguing, we'll try to answer them um, live during the, during the panel. Let me first briefly introduce my fellow panelists to you. My name is Bastian De Leo. I'm the head of business development for the drug delivery team within CDP, a team which is led by Yuri Baruch, partner at Cambridge Design Partnership and the head of our drug delivery group, where he leads a team of engineers from many different disciplines in the design, development, commercialization of drug delivery systems. Joining me also is Claire Beddoes, a senior medical innovation and research consultant, um, working frequently in obtaining user insights with for healthcare practitioners as well as patients in projects in which we design or improve existing drug delivery systems. Last but certainly not least, another partner in the company, Chris Houghton, who's the head of FMCG within Cambridge Design Partnership and is our brand innovation and packaging leader. Today we will be discussing designing and improving drug delivery systems for self-administration and home use. Self-administration is certainly not a new trend, um, but we've seen over the last 10 years a significant rise in the use of devices used for self-administration of pharmaceutical products. For many more different indications than traditionally in the, in the inhalation respiratory space, but now also in many different indications, different routes of administration, and also within the route of administration, for instance, of injectables in different presentation formats, ranging from pre-filled syringes, auto-injectors, and more recently, on-body delivery systems. What we will be doing during our panel today is to share with you some of the experiences and insights that we've gained in working with our clients in the development of a number of these systems both past, present, and future issues we will address. Again, I'd like to remind you, feel free to ask any questions and I will pay, raise them to our, to our panelists. As a first question, I'd like to address this to Yuri. Yuri, looking back over the last five or maybe 10 years or so, we have seen this trend of increasing importance of devices being used for self-administration and home use, both apply to new pharmaceutical products, as well as improvement of existing products or new presentation forms of existing pharmaceutical products. Can you first explain and share your insight of where you think, what opportunities have we been capturing well over the last couple of years? Yeah, I think um, um, opportunity that we capital well is really the the move to self administration. Um, the the idea that the the patient, the user, uh, the caregiver um, can take more responsibility of their uh, disease management and help them um, by giving them devices that can really um, assist them in their day to day life and help them. Um, go about their, uh, their daily life without having to be you know, tied into a machine or carrying a big pouch with them and, and, and ignore the disease as much as possible and maintain um, um, a normal lifestyle. I think that's one of the opportunities that we catch really, really well. Um, and that's been uh, done by really understanding what the user needs are um, and paying much more attention to them than uh, we have ever before. Uh, in the past, it was much more of a um, how can we deliver therapy safely, uh, whereas now uh, the the emphasis is how can we enable the user and and 
really bring out the, the benefits to the user more than anything else. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we in, in previous discussions, and we discuss amongst our, our colleagues uh, quite regularly, we now do that through Zoom rather than meeting up in the office at the coffee area, which I'm sure all the uh, attendees uh, are experiencing the same, that that's no longer possible. Um, but one of the things we discussed, and I'll, I'll raise that to Claire as well, is that um, we see stronger emphasis on the use requirements of the devices, not necessarily the technical and device uh, requirements, even though that is the, that is the starting point. Um, Claire, maybe you can comment in a similar fashion as Yuri did. What of the um, user insight experiences gained over the last couple of years you feel we have addressed as an industry quite well? Um, yeah, so I guess to, to, to mirror what Yuri said about the, you know, the self-administration, putting the control into the hands of the users, um, I think what, the, what we are seeing improvements in is um, the support that is provided to patients in that transition from either oral therapy onto um, an injectable therapy or introducing um, some sort of therapy into their uh, clinical uh, workflow. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the support for the patients is improving. I think there's still a long way to go, however. I think um, what we see more of is the industry focusing more on user needs, which is, which is brilliant. Um, I think that hasn't quite transitioned through to clinical practice as widely as we would like to see as yet. Um, I think uh, we're seeing a, a move from pharma companies to try and provide those options to patients and to try and support those patients. But talking to HCPs, they are still quite often at the level of prescribing a molecule um, and not the device. And so there's a misconception around um, patient choice. Um, and I think there is a, a drive towards offering patient choice. I just don't think that the circle has been closed yet. Um, in terms of actually that filtering back through to actual patient choice. So I think, I think we've seen huge moves, but I think, you know, we still have a long way to go. Thank you very much, Claire. And obviously, there is a, a lot more information available to patients at the moment. They can be perceived as much better informed. But as you said, the, the choice that they have, the true choice they have, um, can be very, very limited. And in that sense is the biggest difference probably with uh, true consumer products, uh, Chris. But I think it's still, um, at least for us within Cambridge Design Partnership, it's been very in, um, insightful to have products both within the healthcare space as well as in the consumer space where we can learn from those elements where um, there's heterogeneity in a consumer group compared to a patient group and how we can address that. And maybe this is a good point for you, Chris, to, uh, to chip in on that. Absolutely. The, the levels of choice in healthcare in different markets obviously varies quite a bit, but uh, it's still stark contrast to that of the consumer sector where you've got a prolif um, so many choices from startups and independent brands uh, challenging the big established companies. Um, where, where consumers have almost got too much choice. Um, it's navigating through those choices that, that can be more challenging in consumer sectors. Yeah, maybe it's that challenging choice that uh, is interesting for Yuri and Claire to, um, to comment on. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about the proper use of training and onboarding uh, when patients for the first time get to self-administer a product. It's very easy for us to say this is an ongoing trend that's been going on for a number of years. But if you are a patient that has been prescribed a device for self-administration for the first time, that is, your, um, that is your first time. And significant amount of education and training um, may be required to a rather heterogeneous uh, patient population. Uh, maybe, Claire, you can start first by addressing the, the consequences of those that heterogeneity in the patient population when we start to um, get the user insights for a particular product designed for a particular therapy area? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, with drug delivery, and if we think about injectables, 
in particular. There are there are themes that are common uh, across the board. So regardless of what um, drug you're delivering, there are there are common themes. But then where it gets really interesting is if you start looking at the indication itself and at the drug, the molecule that you're trying to deliver as a stakeholder in in the process. Um, itself because it has it has needs it has constraints it has challenges um, that go with it um, and I think you know the, the, this this perception of choice as Chris was just saying you know in the consumer space is almost too much choice you know our, our patients don't choose this they don't choose to have these conditions they don't choose to have to administer you know self-inject if we're talking injectables at home um, and often it's around finding the molecule that is right for them and treats their condition effectively. And then, you know, so that choice is like forever limiting and forever narrowing down until you're, you're left with a, a very narrow um, window of, of, of uh, opportunity for choice, really. Um, and so I think, you know, there, there is, again, this misconception that, you know, one, one size fits all because it's, that's certainly not the case. There are, there are different devices available for different molecules um, you know for, for different reasons because those, those individual molecules have their own challenges in terms of um, patient support um, you know that that has evolved massively obviously over the past few years we have um, companies providing in-home training for patients we have patient uh, training programs in clinic we have uh, pharma companies providing online videos. We have quick start guides that are now um, commonly placed in, in boxes to help remind the patient. Um, as we develop therapies that are longer acting, um, you know, we're moving from say daily injection to weekly to monthly to even less frequently than that. And so that brings benefits for the patient, but it also brings challenges around reminding the patient when and how to inject so there's lots of um, opportunity I think to, to better support patients one thing I do hear a lot from HCPs is uh, the concern over non-regulated means of supporting patients so I think YouTube videos um, you know there are there's good content on there but there's also you know it's this is a regulated space this is you know it's not how to you know change a wheel on a car or something is there are good uh, examples but also bad examples and I've, I've spoken to nurses before who train patients on a regular basis and they have their favorite YouTube video of this is how not to do it um, so I think you know there's there needs to be a little bit more care um, and, and thought put into how to support our patients because they're all different and they all have different needs thank you very much Claire and I think um, for Yuri Claire has painted a very interesting picture of the myriad of, of sources available for information through dedicated collection of user insights in a specific patient population for a specific product, but also best practice um, seen over the, the last couple of years when with the experience gained, but also maybe uh, worse practice with people freely being able um, to put information on the uh, on the internet about their experience with particular products. Uh, for you and your team, um, that's quite a, um, a hefty challenge to integrate that all um, into your development programs um, with your uh, with the customers. Um, and you can obviously fully rely on the the, the, the dedicated. Uh, gathering of information, but you cannot ignore this myriad of unofficial information that uh, that Claire just postulated. Yeah, no, no, you can't, you can't ignore it. Um, we're aware of it. I mean, the the fact that the um, devices are still a challenge, even though we try not try not to make them so, is is evident by the 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 growth in companies uh, creating training devices and training videos and training websites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I you're talking about the videos how not to do it. I actually remember um, a presentation about two, three years ago from one of the training companies um, where they were showing a video of an actual nurse showing a patient how to do something and showing them in the completely wrong way how to do it and, and just giving them horrible advice. And all of that was obviously on the internet. Um, and this is a nurse, so obviously she knows what she's doing. Um, 
Um, I, I, the challenge now is that we've moved the choice into the, the, the user's hands. And the challenge as designers is, um, and engineers is to take all that input, the, the, um, the good practice, or, and also what could go wrong and what we need to design for, and to include all of that into a device that has to be cost effective uh, on one hand, has to be um, made in high quantities, and has to be very easy to use, right? Uh, by a variety of users, and sometimes um, multiple indications. So the same platform may need to be used for several different patient groups, which are very, very, very different from each other, and they all have to rely on their pre-existing knowledge sometimes and limited training to do that. And as Claire added another complication, they also have to uh, now remember how to do it from month to month because indications or, or, or you know, therapies are becoming more long acting. Um, so all those complications together uh, present an interesting challenge. We go through a variety of things. We look at um, um, uh, on, on the on ethnography, so, so research on the internet in forums, etc. And uh, including surveys to understand what uh, users uh, um, um, have difficulties with or what they would like to see. We t talk to uh, HCP, as Claire does, on a regular basis. Um, we look at um, incidents with um, previous device designs, etc., and include all of those in the designs of new ones. Um, and that really is the most holistic way of, of making sure we address as many of them as possible. And while we're doing it, continue to test it with users, continually test it with users, and iterate until we get it to the, the best possible um, um, product that we can. Obviously, within the, the constraints of the, of, of the program timeline, etc. That's a very nice point, Yuri. Continue to test, continue to test. And I see Chris already unmuting himself because I'm sure he wants, he's the, he, is, he wants to say something. And I know where he's going at. And I'm going to ask you the question, Chris. Um, within the consumer, uh, business, the, 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 the cycle times are much shorter uh, and there's much, uh, it's much easier to get the feedback from the, from the consumer in the market and improve your product on the basis of that feedback, something that within the healthcare space or the pharmaceutical space is much more difficult. However, what is your view on that and how do you think we can actually learn from that consumer uh, space um, and, and build that into designing and improving drug delivery systems for self-administration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, pockets of the consumer sectors have very fast cycle times. Uh, others where there's huge, you know, manufacturing infrastructure, that can still take three to four years, which still in a healthcare context is, is pretty fast. Um, but uh, just going back to the, the discussion around um, use for instructions, when, when we look at those, we try to make them as as graphic and as visible as possible as if you were designing uh, for Lego or for Ikea, where the, the instructions are so clear, they almost can do without language altogether. I think um, Claire's point around the unregulated uh, YouTube postings, um, that's, that's very common in the, in the consumer uh, sectors as well. Some of which is healthy, some of which is, is really quite dangerous. And obviously the more you get into healthcare, it, the, the stakes become um, much higher. But from a, a user's, a patient's point of view, they, they need that accessibility and ease. So we try to integrate that interface as one of the first touch points when you're opening in a box, opening a device. It, it's one of the first things that, that you're registered with. But uh, certainly having a whole toolkit of different routes to learning um, is, is key. Claire, it's something that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure you want to, to comment on, especially when you talk about how a new device is being presented to a patient. Is the first, is the first touch point, is your first chance to get it right or to get it wrong um, in the hands of, uh, of that patient. Um, packaging and presentation, not necessarily the first thing um, that people start on when they design drug delivery systems or new presentations. For existing products, uh, but you and your team very frequently um, take that as a very integral part um, of the assessments and of your interactions with uh, the patients and the HCPs to, to get the insights. Can you comment a little bit further on that? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 fascinating. You look at, at, at some of the devices that we take out and we and we test, and and you know, to use Chris's um, point of view on the sort of making the instructions as as sort of graphic and and sort of picture um, centric as as possible to try and guide those those patients through, and that that that's great to some extent. But the risk um, that we have around that is um, an assumption that. That, that we know how to use it. So, you know, how often do you even read the quick start guide now when you get a new phone? You just assume that you know how to use it and then, you know, maybe it's set up properly, maybe it's not. And and some of the studies that we've done recently where we have taken devices and quick start guides and put them in the hands of, again, as Yuri said, an experienced nurse, they, 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 the assumption is that they, they know how to use it. And we've seen things like people trying to inject through a cap because there was air holes at the end of the cap for um, to prevent choking. If somebody takes you know pen like a pen lid, think a pen lid. Um, trying to inject through there, um, not just not not waiting the uh, correct amount of time after the second click, let's say, um, for the injection to finish. And and had had that been a real injection, the the full dose of drug wouldn't have been delivered which which for some indications is just an annoyance for other indications is, is very very serious um, indeed so I think um, there, the the industry hasn't yet caught up on the need for, for packaging the need for that unboxing to be um, as educational and informative and, and lead that that user through um, what what can sometimes be quite complex steps um, although you know Yuri's team try to design out that complexity, sometimes you just cannot avoid that um, uh, to to a certain extent. And I think you know we 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 need we need more work on that. The the counter side to that is obviously the the regulatory space has not yet caught up on that. And so you know a lot of there is a lot of um, you know regulations around um, uh, user. Uh, guides and 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 boxing and um, you know around um, keeping things sterile for obvious reasons. But I think you know there are there are ways that we can work around that, and and we're certainly seeing a lot more interest um, in in using the the outer box, if you like, as a way of 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 educating people and and trying to ensure that mistakes that could be made aren't made. Um, and as I say, it's as Yuri said earlier, it's fascinating even hcps who've, who've been injecting people and training people for years just make so many mistakes so there are, there are definitely opportunities that we should be taking from the consumer space and, and putting it in this um, drug delivery space for sure yeah. yeah well we've been talking about patients we've been talking about other stakeholders like the hcp uh, as well family um, around um, one of the things um, we've seen a number of uh, a number of studies, Claire, and, and you've recently addressed in in a conference presentation and, and, and separate webinar in this session that you've done around digital was around making sure the right information is captured from the right stakeholder and also being used by the right stakeholder, and it aligns with what we discussed with Chris and Yuri before about patients becoming somewhat of a consumer or showing more consumer uh, behavior, but they, they can't be a consumer. On the other end, what has been very much driving this trend, or maybe um, not even just this trend, but more, more so in society, people are not just trying to fit the therapy uh, or adjust their therapy to their lifestyle, but actually the therapy has to fit within their lifestyle but also the therapy has to fit within the whole provision of, uh, provision of healthcare. And that discussion as to what information is gathered when and built into the, the development programs that I've seen with your team, Zuri, uh, is not always easy to, to implement and make sure that um, the different factors get, um, get the right attention. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I wanted to actually touch on what Claire said beforehand on, on packaging. Sorry to hijack this, Sebastian. Um, no worries. I think um, one uh, sometimes missed opportunity is, is what Claire said about packaging. I think packaging is a, is, a, is the unloved child 
of the pharma industry. It's one of those things, it's just a box, it's there to protect the medication. There are some regulations that we need to put labeling on it, etc. We're sometimes limited by color, so it's not even interesting from a marketing perspective. So we'll just make it a box and be done with it. And if we need to do anything, we'll do a device or we'll do a trainer. And what we're seeing a lot more from our customers and uh, um, innovation opportunities is actually rather than changing an existing device or rather than having to completely redesign a platform uh, to deliver a new therapy where there is new need, um, we've been working a lot more on actually designing the packaging, and I don't mean just a um, um, quick start guide, etc. Actually making the packaging, adding value to the packaging to be more than a box. Um, actually giving packaging some, some um, um, functional um, uh, use apart from just protecting the medication and carrying it and uh, really um, making the unboxing uh, experience to the user an educational one and a guiding one to make them comfortable for the process to to make them um, to um, assure them that they're doing the right thing that they're doing the right thing in the right sequence and that they haven't forgotten anything and really giving them a safe space to do you think of um, an unboxing where you can have a prep area for the device with everything that's needed? Uh, instructions on the packaging itself. The unboxing is done in stages, so you don't forget something and actually do it in the right format. For instance, nowadays, um, using more than one auto-injector for therapies with large volumes where we don't necessarily want to go to non-body injection, um, how do you ensure that users use that? Or if you need to go to titration, how do you ensure that? If you need to um, uh, go through some mixing stages, all those things can be done through not just a quick start guide, but really a much more, um, a much richer unpackaging experience. And, you know, we've seen this, at Chris, from a consumer perspective, um, you know, Amazon uh, uh, frustration free packaging. There are lots of other examples where the packaging is part of the device experience, part of the bu buying experience and, and, and using experience and isn't just a protective box. And then that's something that really is um, needs to be embraced, I would say, by the pharma company. Because for the value of a carton, carton box, you can do a lot more with just a few a few words printed on it. Yeah, and we've seen a number of these projects that you know devices they have to be effective, they have to be safe to use, and in order to be effectively used, preferably they should be easy um, to use, if not if not intuitive. But we've learned that within individual patient populations or specific therapy areas, you have to dig one or maybe two levels deeper to understand how you can achieve that, not only with the design of the device, but again also with the packaging of the device. And what Chris has, has seen and experienced and talked about uh, in consumer products before is that it contributes to empowering people, f people feeling in control of um, the benefit that the product will create for them. Is that something you can address a little bit further, Chris? Yeah, uh, I mean, Yuri described the role of packaging being more than a box um, really well. Um, for many in the, the consumer space, it's you know, a key differentiator. It's, it's the thing that carries the brand's identity. It's the thing that you recognize from 10 paces down the, down the supermarket aisle. Um, and it really is an integral part of how all of the product and innovation pipelines thought about. It's not the thing that you do once you've designed the device. It's all, it's all designed um, as an integral experience. Um, obviously, some of the sort of pressing issues in the consumer space are very different uh, to healthcare, uh, sustainability being a big one where, um, you know, brands and companies are thinking about their overall impact to the environment, to the world. Um, it's very top of mind to consumers and patients. Um, but what it, what consumers and patients aren't really willing to do is change their behavior too much or add more complexity. Um, so that's more reliance on the system and the infrastructure that surrounds them to solve that problem, uh, you know, to make things more affordable, make them more sustainable, uh, make them more usable. Um, so yeah, you, you really need to think about all of the elements. Uh, but yeah, certainly bringing an element of brand thinking into healthcare would be a breath of fresh air. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Chris. Um, obviously, uh, when we talk about drug delivery systems, 
um, and we talk about designing them for self-administration and home use. Um, many of, in many of the conferences that we unfortunately uh, we cannot attend to and uh, the attendees here at this webinar cannot uh, attend um, at, at the moment, there's a lot of talk about digital um, technologies and implementation of digital tools within devices but also within the, um, the development uh, trajectory of devices of this uh, of this kind. A um, couple of years ago, it was almost presented as digital tools are going to be the, the single solution um, to all the challenges we have in drug delivery systems. That's clearly not uh, the, the general perception um, anymore. And let's start with um, that um, information on, on, on gathering the information for it and, and tie into your uh, past webinar. Uh, Claire, how do you make sure that you you know you use the right tools, and how do you get the right information from stakeholders to understand to what extent, for a particular product, digital could be the solution or part of the solution? Yeah, sure. I think um, you know you raised a really good point that you said you know a few years ago it was you know this is going to take the world by storm, and we're going to see connectivity everywhere. Um, it's going to be connected devices, you know, wall to wall. Um, and I think we have seen device developers, you know, making sure that they are adding in a connectivity um, uh, element to their devices. But what we haven't seen yet is that filtering through to the market in, in the massive waves that, that were predicted. And, you know, the, the question, I guess, is, is why is that the case? And I think um, the Number one, it's, very, it's obviously a very expensive thing to do um, and it's a very time consuming thing to do. And I think it needs it needs very, very careful thought about, you know, what is digital? You know, what 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 is the company's digital strategy and how why do you want a connected device? Do you want a connected device? Um, do you want the patient to interact with that connectivity um, or is that connectivity silent and just communicating to who? And for what reason? Um, and I think a lot of the time when we talk to clients about this and we and we start asking these questions, um, that hasn't necessarily been thought through in the amount of detail that it needs to be thought through. And I think you know what we're finding more and more is 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 you know we're helping companies think think that through in, in more detail because before you answer those questions, you know the the, the, the phrase that we hear again and again is um, well it, we need a connected device. Well, why? Well, because everybody else is doing one. Um, and and, and th while that is a reason and, and maybe a valid reason, it's, it's, it's not going to, you know, um, get you more market share necessarily without thinking through who are you connect collecting the data for, what data are you collecting, and what do you want them to do with that data that they can't currently do without that data? Um, you know, I, I speak to um, patients and, and HCPs all the time, and it depends very much on what demographic you talk to, what um, indication those patients have. Some patients love the idea. They, they, they like the idea of being taken care of in a better way as they see it. Um, my clinician will know exactly how I'm feeling today, whether I've taken my drug, whether I've had any side effects whether my condition is improving or stabilizing. Um, you talk to the HCPs on the other hand, and they almost you know, hold up their hands in horror because um, you know, they, they ask, what do you want me to do with that information? Um, and until you can answer those questions and can convince the HCPs and the payers that the higher cost device is going to bring cost saving benefits and time saving benefits for them, as well as clinical benefits for their patients, but but you know we're working in a cost-constrained healthcare system, so we need to be mindful of that. And I think that it just needs a lot of thought and a lot of unpicking. And I think that's why we're not seeing the um, you know vast waves of connected devices filtering through as yet. Yeah, and maybe that's a question then to Chris: How similar or dissimilar is this to the consumer product world? Yeah, I think it's it's very different the um the language often in the consumer sector is fail fast you know test something learn from it you know correct from your mistakes uh, in healthcare the stakes are way too high to be failing at all let alone failing fast 
Um, so yeah, it's very diff uh, different. Um, uh, it's also different in terms of the people entering the market. All of the the digital pioneers really came from the consumer sectors and disrupted the establishment, as it were. Um, so the, again, the the environment of um, challenge between competitive landscapes is is, is very different. Um, you know where uh, digital pioneers have have come in, taken huge parts of businesses away and and consumer companies feel under threat by that so they've been more proactive um, but the commonalities with both consumer and healthcare is really um, you know where's the value is the value with the consumer with the patient are they clearly seeing a benefit from having this integration or, or to Claire's point, Claire's point is it adding just another step that I'll probably don't want to do. I'll probably forget about you're just adding cost to a device for no, no good reason. So yeah, the, the rationale, um, and, and also understanding the, the gains within that sort of stakeholder community, because, um, you may not see the direct benefit yourself. It might be, um, the insurance company that, that gets the benefit ra rather than the drug provider. So it's a very complicated, business model that you almost need to work out to understand where's the value, where's the gain, um, how much are consumers, patients willing to give up their own privacy for, uh, you know, for providing this data. Um, GDPR came in through um, regulatory catching up with how consumer companies are misusing, mishandling data. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very exciting but, but complex topic. Yeah, and then, interestingly enough, there's a question coming in which Yuri, maybe you could um, you could use in, in in your addressing of this um, of this element. Claire mentioned clearly, we do get a lot of requests for can you do a connected version, uh, and then obviously the question becomes becomes why. Um, there's a question is here. So why has pharma not gotten on board with marketing connected products? They're spending a lot of development money in evaluating these these products, uh, but it's not gone yet into market promotion, getting the market ready for these, with the postulation here that COVID-19 might be a catalyst um, in this. How do you see this? I think that um, what Claire said is, is correct. People do, Currently, we just hear people say, okay, so people come to us asking for a connected device, and when we ask them why they need it, we find out that before we even design a device for them, we need to help them with their digital strategy and understand what they actually are looking for. Why are they, why are they exploring this space? What are the benefits? And I'm not saying there aren't. What are the benefits in doing it? Uh, and what are the risks in taking on something like that? Have they considered what the issues are with going digital? But apart from the costs and maybe failing, uh, but there are numerous issues with going digital. A, you're adding um, a potential step. Uh, you need to connect the device. If it's a disposable device, would you get the user to connect them every single time they use it? That, I, I doubt any user will do that. Uh, I, I find it uh, too much of a hassle to connect every new device that I buy. If I had to connect my my um, my Sonos uh, speaker every time I wanted to use it, I probably wouldn't use it. Um, that, that that's the truth. And that's for a consumer device, not for something um, that I'm I get no benefit from uh, easily. Um, moving on from that. Um, what kind of data are you collecting? Why are you collecting it? What are the risks of collecting that data? How do you store it? What are the costs in storing it? Uh, what are the risks in the, those, those pieces of data going missing or someone hacking and no system is foolproof? So what happens once those uh, details get hacked and go on the internet? How do you separate those details from the patient name? Can you, can you make those two systems completely separate so that even if one gets... Uh, get, gets hacked, you don't get all the information, you just get some of it. Those are all considerations that, you know, what about the longevity of the thing? How long do you, pharma devices might sometimes last for 20 years? Those components probably won't be there in 20 years' time. So what's the life cycle of that device? Which, you know, plastic is plastic, that's easy. Um, uh, if you're talking about a car, imagine getting parts for a car 30 or 40 years later when maybe some suppliers have gone out of business, especially with COVID, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Now, again, that's not me saying we shouldn't do it. It's, it's me saying we really need to consider why we're doing it and what are the benefits. One area we see amazing benefit is diabetes. 
and, and you can see there are lots of companies playing in that space and it's a very obvious space to play in because it's it, it, it you're offering immediate benefit to the user i've connected two things together you now no longer have to log them i'm doing all the work for you uh, we might close the loop at some point and and use the the uh, ai or, or machine learning or whatever to actually um foresee how you behave during the day when you eat lunch when you go on a run and titrate insulin accordingly all those things those are huge benefits you can see so if you can fit the benefit with what the technology adds i would i would absolutely advocate for it if you can't see the immediate benefit stop and ask yourself why you're doing it what are you getting from the data and and how are you how are you going to how are you going to monetize it? And I don't mean make money from it. I mean monetize it. What benefit does it add to the user? And, and the risk I always highlight to my clients is, so assuming you've done all of this and the users don't like it, you've just added a, another bit to your existing device. You've connected it. You've added cost to it. Did you get any benefit from it? Did the users get any benefit from it? Have you actually added some annoyance that means that they move to another device? If you get it right, it's amazing. Uh, and I, I don't like to, to mention Apple, but Apple in this case, the new AirPods that they have, you, the old ones you have to connect. The new ones you just open and they'll connect to the closest Apple device that you own. Can you imagine a better, a better uh, uh, infrastructure, you know, a better uh, um, environment? Uh, you know, every device you have and somebody connects to everything else, as long as it's Apple, of course, which, which again, from a from a from a pharma perspective, that that maybe doesn't work. But if it's a service or across many devices, again in diabetes, for instance, a CGM and and a pen or a pump and and a logbook and other um, um, bits of um, tech that can um, join together and add to the user experience and help them. Uh, you can see it in a lot of different areas, but um, but you know, insulin is the one that that's the that's the poster child. Really? And, and I think that's a very good example, Yuri. And I, you agree very much with this attendee that asked the, the, the question because he also postulated that um, it's the fragmented nature of healthcare that has stopped or limited a lot of these progress. And what all the all three of you have just said, it's an understanding where where does the value reside, where does the cost reside of developing it, and where where does the risk uh, is, uh, reside when you have these products out on the market. And in the diabetes space, that is probably the most um, well-integrated part that we uh, that we can think of. Uh, there's more questions um, coming in at the at the moment, um, and, and maybe this is an interesting one to um, to take a slight uh, step away from from diabetes as a very much a long-term treatment. Because a specific question has come in from one of the attendees is in this context, what challenges do you see? For the use of emergency devices, where we're actually talk, talking about situations which are self-administration, or maybe not self-administration, but certainly not by a trained individual, and it may not even be in the home. With all that we discussed so far, um, Yuri, let, let's start off with you first. What challenges do you specifically still see for emergency devices, and what opportunities maybe? I, I think of emergency devices like, um, so I, 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 not to talk about em emergency injectors, right? Let's take, let's take um, anaphylaxis completely out of it. Imagine an, a defibrillator. You're, you're out in the, you know, right, um, if I'm, a, if I'm a, a, a sufferer with, with a heart condition and I need, I won't carry a defibrillator with me because it's just too big. Um, but if it happens and I fall down in the street and I'm having a heart attack, um, a, where is the nearest one? Uh, once I get one, let's say I get one, right? It's in a public place and I know where it is. Um, I've dialed my own. How do I use it next? Uh, how complicated is it to use it? Have I ever done it before? I'm in a stressful situation. The person's on the floor. I'm not a trained doctor. Um, and now I have to, my, you know, the life of the person on the ground is in my hands and I need to save them using this thing. Um, emergency devices, um, have emergency injectors have the same uh, sort of challenges. Um, you're, you're trying to do something you may you didn't think you would ever need to do. Um, I, I had the, the dubious pleasure of, of using gas masks uh, when I was growing up in Israel, and the first time you use it, you just go, I have no I have no idea how to use this thing. It's like 
It's, it's completely foreign to any, everything I've ever done before. I've seen it in films, but that's about it. And in a stressful situation, suddenly your mind goes completely blank. You don't do things that you would normally just go, oh, that's really easy to do. Right? That, that's really easy to understand. If I wasn't in a stressful situation, I could immediately do it. Um, that's the kind of issue that you see with emergency devices. They have to be, they have to either guide the user through every step of the way, which is what defibrillators actually do, the, the, the um, state of the art today. Um, and they have to be so, or they have to be so ubiquitous, so ubiquitous that it's so clear to understand what you need to do with them that you potentially can't make a mistake. Uh, and you can see um, current, uh, some of the existing uh, companies are taking steps towards that. But I would say the way, you know, we have a way to go. Um, um, some of my pharma colleagues would probably say, uh, first, make sure that all of them actually get their act together and get the devices to work 100% of the time. Uh, because that's, that's a current uh, issue with some of the existing ones, as we know, with the recent recalls. So let's make sure they work first. Um, that we don't have the luxury of devices failing. Um, and then go on to the, to the, let's make sure that users can actually use them. But I think it's a combination. First of all, emergency devices, um, make sure that they work 100% of the time, and then make sure that they are so easy to use that anyone can use them pretty much immediately, or we can, we've got a guidance system that helps them understand how to use it on the spot, even though they're in a stressful situation. Uh, now, and, and to, to the user, the, the, uh, the participant that asked this, um, some people say that size is an issue and people don't carry them. I, I, I would challenge that. Um, I, I think people don't carry them for, and don't use them for a variety of reasons. I don't think size is the major issue because um, all of us carry a phone and some of them are huge in size and people never forget them, ever. Right? And you immediately know when you've forgotten your phone. It's one of those things. And I haven't seen injectors the size of phones. So I, I kind of think size is, is a secondary thing. Yeah, there's cer certainly behavioral elements to it, and I'm sure Chris and Claire want to comment on that in, 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 in that respect um, as well, how, how behavior and, and, and um, affects the, the, the uptake or acceptance of certain, certain products, Chris. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I feel that's part of the job of the designer. You, you look to the adjacencies of what people use, the things people are familiar with, and you try to draw comparisons to them so in an emergency situation the act of handling orientating undertaking steps is as familiar and intuitive as as possible um you know you, you sort of think how many times have i actually used a fire extinguisher how many have i even put a life jacket on even though i've seen the flight display hundreds of times um you know you, you need to try and look at that, that's the beauty of working across a number of categories and sectors. You, you learn what are the common behaviors, what are the, the, the common formats. You know, the semiotics of a, a product describes how it should be read and used to a consumer. That, that's all part of the responsibility of the designer to draw those analogies and, and make it simple. That's, that's a great point. There was, a, um, there was there, someone noted it in the, in the um, HF um team that there was a i think it was a russian flight that lost cabin pressure and there was a picture of everyone wearing their you know the the oxygen masks on their face how many times have we seen that right Multi, i mean I, I can't I'm flying you know probably hundreds of times half of the people on the plane had, still didn't have the mask covering their nose right Stressful situation. They, they were they they had the, they were shown it that day. They still didn't get it right. So um, yeah, it's an interesting challenge. I think it comes back to an earlier point as well that you were saying about design briefs. You know, design me a connected product. Um, clients <laughs> love to brief you the solution. We need to be briefed the problem. You know, um, help us understand the problem. Help us define that the the actual. Um, problem that we're solving for that's why we undertake um you know an evidence-based approach so the reason for what we're doing is is really well defined and and justified um you know things that um, injectable devices that diagnose and dose as an integral system that wasn't briefed as a solution that was briefed as a remove the number of steps i have to take in 
you know, the, the diagnostics and the delivery of, of the device. A, you know, a, a good product comes from a, a good brief. Sorry, Claire. No worries, but uh, the, the questions are popping in from the audience, and thank you very much for that. I really like uh, your, uh, your active participation here. And there's one that actually comes, uh, is related to this, but the opposite. This is the frequency associated with use of products and whether we can comment on our experience with compliance data on using auto-injectors, both, um, let's say, daily versus weekly versus two-weekly in the question, but maybe even less frequent. And, and maybe, Claire, you can address that because that um, it, maybe it's not as infrequent, hopefully, as the use of some of those uh, emergency uh, emergency products, but you know, once a month, once every two months, that is not frequent. That is, I mean, if I wouldn't fly for two weeks, maybe I wouldn't know how to open the emergency door anymore. Yeah, I think you know, it's 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 really interesting. We've looked into this. Um, you know, like we were saying earlier, a lot of a lot of therapies now are focused on um, less frequent administration because people have to inject themselves less frequently, and that's that's a good thing. Um, and I think, you know, maybe we had a, a, you know, there's a misconception out there that, well, you know, you go from, you know, daily, daily is easy to remember, you know, you, 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 you brush your teeth and then you take your medication or whatever, you can get it into your daily routine. Um, same with, same with weekly. Um, we, when we speak to patients about going less frequent, you know, you know, where, what are the challenges around um, remembering when and how to inject? Uh, monthly or every two months or even every three months um, you know actually uh, it, it becomes a bit of an occasion for them certainly the ones that are, are injecting less frequently than say a month um, so so it's set on their calendar they maybe set a reminder in their phone um, it's 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 not a burden anymore. It's not a, not a daily or a weekly burden, but it's 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 an occasion that they prepare themselves for. Um, and I think uh, I mean we know compliance is is bad anyway. But what I think what I'm trying to say is I don't I don't think that the compliance the effect on compliance of breaking that daily or weekly or monthly cycle is 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 necessarily as bad as as you might think it would be. Um, I think patients who are on uh, once every two months or once every three months or even once every six months, um, you know, and, and clinicians are aware of it and they, they tie it around, um, you know, uh, clinician appointments to, to remind people. Some people may even choose if they're only getting an injection once every six months, they might actually just choose to have it in the, in the clinic um, by their clinician when they're in seeing them anyway for their six monthly checkup. So I think, um, you know, the, the injection schedule is, is, is an interesting one. I don't think we're seeing the impact on compliance that you might think that there is. But there is a wider issue, right, around compliance and adherence and, and being able to track that. And that is, that is an, an ongoing issue uh, with users. And, and it's a concern for the HCPs that, that we talk with. And, and it's something that, that companies will mention when they're mentioning that connectivity in digital. Well, it's a way to track um, patient adherence. It's a way to log um, whether somebody is taking their medication into their electronic medical record, and then we can call it up when we see them twice a year um, or whatever. That is assuming that every healthcare system has electronic medical records and, and certainly here in the UK um, you know a hospital in Cambridge has electronic medical records hospital up the road uh, in Kings Lynn doesn't so you know just uh, a matter of miles apart you know we have again we come back to this disconnected nature of our of our healthcare systems but but adherence and compliance are certainly areas that it's hugely complex. It's around patient psychology. It's around, you know, a lot of the patients that, that, that we're dealing with have comorbidities. They're not just on your molecule. They're maybe on several other molecules that, that are coming from other companies that require um, other um, dosing schedules and other um, burdens on the patient. So it, it, it's a hugely complex, complex area. Yeah, and, and again, it ties in with another question. Uh, they're, they're, they continue popping in. Um, 
do we have any insights on the volumes being requested for use in the home injection scenario? And I think you touched on something, Claire, there. Not every product has to be designed for self-administration if it potentially doesn't fit that particular uh, interaction with the HCP in light of that particular uh, particular therapy. But I think it's fair to say that the large majority of, of, of product opportunities and briefs we're getting are predominantly self-administration. But it doesn't always have to be the right, the right format. I'm assuming the volumes question also meant the, the volume of injection that was required. That's really wrong. That, uh, that's a, that's another way of interpreting the question. So let's let's take that that uh, that one as well. Yeah. Um, no, that's what Michael meant. But uh, yeah. um, the um, the volume in injection are, are varying massively and I think that's not only because of existing um, therapies but also because of future therapies so a lot of call it future proofing by pharma companies trying to see where their uh, pipeline will lead them and you know whether they can reformulate or not um, um, they, they're, they're, they're basically future proofing by saying well the volumes might be up to 20 ml for instance um, um, I've seen 50 but if I'm honest, at that point and at that level, we might as well use an infusion pump. Um, I don't see the, the benefit in, in um, on-body delivery systems um, with 50 ml. I just, I just don't see that. Well, one versus the other doesn't really uh, fit, but again, that's just me. I'm hoping that's the right question. It might not be. Okay, well, and we, we can address that. So every individual question can be addressed uh, offline um, from this uh, as well. There's one question that I'd like to uh, uh, address still here uh, with the limited time that we have left. And that is, are brand owners asking for sustainable aspects to be included in new designs? For example, the ease of assembly to enable devices to go into the recycle stream and are consumers likely to take on board removing components that can go into regular recycling at home rather than taking a whole device and return it back to a pharmacy or company? And Chris, this is something that I know is uh, close to your heart. Yeah, yeah, and we are seeing pockets of it. It's obviously, um, you know, been in the consumer world's mind for 10, 20 years, um, but it's certainly um, growing and, and more front of mind than it ever be, uh, has ever been. Um, but again, it presents um, complexities in the same way that, that digital does. But the, the point around innovation is... Uh, you innovate for tomorrow if you if you're basing everything on today's knowledge and today's market you're going to be seven ten years behind the curve so you need to look at where those futures are going um and and include digital and sustainability as part of those strategies otherwise you're you're likely to be left behind thanks very much chris um with that uh, and the time running out, I think it's nice to end on the theme of recyclability and end of life as a product, because at least it means it's a product that has been designed, developed, uh, and used. And that is what we all try to what we all try to do. I would like to thank my my colleagues and fellow panelists, but certainly, and most importantly, I want to thank the attendees for attending this web panel um, today. We look forward um, to be discussing your product opportunities. Uh, with you and are always ready, willing, and able um, to do that. Many of you have very interesting um, uh, ideas that can be brought to the table, and I'm sure that we could, um, with our team of specialists at CDP, come to the right product brief that actually results in designing the, the right product for you and your, and your particular customers. So with that, thank you very much. Um, take, um, take good care, stay safe. Um, and we look forward to uh, talking to you again and seeing you again in one of these uh, webinars and hopefully in the not too distant future uh, back in our regular format of seeing you at uh, conferences around the world. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.